Our sermon passage this morning is Psalm 110. So will you turn there with me? The book of Psalms is in the middle of your Bible. And I'll be reading chapter 110. Psalm 110, beginning in verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Thanks, Mallory. Well, we are continuing our sermon series together this morning through some selected psalms uh, through the end of the year. And specifically, we are continuing our, uh, our little series within the series through some of the royal or, or messianic psalms through this Advent season uh, to help us build up a sense of, of longing and anticipation as we wait for Christmas, as we prepare our hearts for what we celebrate at Christmas. And so uh, before we dive into Psalm 110 here this morning, the, the question is, why would we choose to go through these royal psalms in the weeks leading up to Christmas? Like, why, why this as an Advent sermon series? And why Psalm 110 this week in particular, the, the Sunday before Christmas Eve? And so as I was thinking about that question as I was preparing for this morning, um, I got to thinking about a conversation we had in our discipleship community Wednesday night about uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Um, how many of you have seen that at some point? Yeah, I think most of us probably have. I mean, it's a classic, right? And based on the research I did, it seems like it first aired in 1965. So if I'm doing my math right, that means it's going on about 60 years old. Uh, but, but the conversation we had on Wednesday night was about how well it holds up and, and how relatable it still is even today. And so if, if you remember in that little show, the, the main conflict in the story is that Charlie Brown is frustrated by the, the commercialization of Christmas and how shallow all the the Christmas traditions around him seem to be. Like, even his dog gets caught up in it all, right? And and, and it leaves him struggling to feel the the joy that he knows that he should feel. But as Charlie Brown tries to approach Christmas differently than everyone around him, um, in typical Charlie Brown fashion, everything he does seems to fall apart and and fail miserably. And, And it all leads to this pivotal point where Charlie Brown cries out, everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And if you remember, Linus responds, sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And and he walks onto the stage where they're practicing their Christmas play, and and the lights dim, and Linus quotes Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14 in, in the old King James Version. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And then Linus walks back over to Charlie Brown, and and what does he say? That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. And so I'm not sure what part of the passage that that Linus or the writers of Charlie Brown Christmas intended to emphasize, but but the point is, he's right, right? 
That is what Christmas is all about. That's why we celebrate. That, that's what we're building up our longing and anticipation for during Advent. The birth of that baby. But, but the question is, why is that what Christmas is all about? Why was the birth of that baby worth a multitude of angels announcing it and, and praising God at his birth? Like, why is that good news of great joy for all people? Why is that worth anticipating and celebrating every year? Like, it can be so easy to be like the characters in Charlie Brown Christmas where we get so caught up in the traditions and the gifts and the music and the lights and the nostalgia of Christmas that we don't stop to think about what it's all about. Like, even as, Christmas, as Christians, we, we may know the right answer to Charlie Brown's question, but, but we can so easily get distracted this time of year. And even giving the right answer, our, our understanding of what the birth of that baby means and why it's such a big deal can just scratch the surface in a whole lot of ways. And so that's why we've been going through these royal psalms as our Advent series this year. Like, that's why we spent time in Psalm 2 and Psalm 72 and now Psalm 110 this week. Because when the angels told the shepherds that a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, had been born... Each one of those words was loaded with meaning and longing and anticipation going back hundreds and even thousands of years leading up to that moment. And these royal psalms help us better understand what the angel's announcement meant, get a taste of the, the longing and, and anticipation leading up to that moment, and, and to feel even more of this great joy that we should feel as we celebrate the birth of this baby. Be because Christmas is all about the birth of the King, the Christ, the Messiah. Those titles refer to the promised King who is the fulfillment of all the promises made to David and to Abraham and to Adam. And the royal psalms help us understand what it means that that king has been born. Like what it meant then, what that means for our lives now, 2,000 years later, and what it means for our lives a billion years from now. Like that's what Psalm 110 is going to do for us here this morning. Like this is another royal psalm written by David. Uh, it seems, seems though in this case that it's almost entirely focused on the future king God promised David would ultimately come from his line, so, so the Messiah. And, and it's so important in the overall storyline of Scripture, this psalm, Psalm 110, that it's quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament passage. Jesus quotes it. Peter quotes it at Pentecost. Paul alludes to it over and over again. Pretty much the entire book of Hebrews is drawing on this psalm. Like, there, there is so much in these seven verses. What we're going to see here, though, in this psalm here this morning is that God is going to speak two times and make two pronouncements about the Messiah. One in verse 1 and then one in verse 4. And in these two pronouncements, God gives the Messiah two deeply meaningful and significant roles or offices. And then we'll see that after each pronouncement are two results then that flow out of and help us understand the meaning and significance of the Messiah being given each of these roles. And so you can see this on your handout. What we're going to do is walk through this psalm looking at the first pronouncement in verse 1 first and then the two results that flow out of that in verses 2 and 3. And then we'll look at the second pronouncement in verse 4 and then the two results of that in verses 5 through 7. And, and as we go through this psalm together then, what we're going to see is that all of this comes together to help us better understand what it means that a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, was born 2,000 years ago so that we will feel even more of the eager anticipation of this Advent season and, and the great joy of what Christmas is all about. So, so look with me at the first thing that God says here. The first pronouncement here in Psalm 110, verse 1, and, and it's this. You can see this on your handout. That the Messiah will be the ultimate eternal king from the line of David. The Messiah will be the ultimate eternal king from the line of David. So look with me at Psalm 110, verse 1. 
Psalm 110, a psalm of David says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the first line of verse 1 here is really important to follow what's happening here. So it says, the Lord says to my Lord. And so in English, that's a little confusing. But, but in the Hebrew, those two words, the Lord and my Lord, are, are actually two different words. And so the first one, the Lord, with a capital L and then small caps O-R-D there, in, in the Hebrew, that's actually the personal name of God. Um, out of reverence for God's name, though, when, when Hebrew readers would come across God's name in the text, they wouldn't say his name out loud. And instead, they would replace it with the word Lord. And, and so that practice carried over into translations of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and, and so that's why it gets translated that way in our Bibles here this morning. But, but to make it more obvious that that's what they're doing in our English Bibles, they'll put the word Lord in small caps like this so that it stands out as the name of God. And so whenever you see that, that's what's going on here. We'll see that multiple times here in Psalm 110. So pay attention to that. But the point is that this is God speaking here. And he's saying something then to someone else who it's called my Lord. And so the word Lord there at the end of that line is actually the Hebrew word for Lord, which means someone who has authority over you. And so remember though, this psalm is written by David. We saw that at the, in the, at the very beginning of this. And so when it says, my Lord there, the implication is that God is speaking to David's Lord. That's who he's talking about here in verse 1. But David's the king. Like, there wasn't anyone who had authority over him other than God, and he's the one talking. So, so who's he talking to here? So this is where it's really important to know your Old Testament. At least the story so far from Genesis through 1 and 2 Samuel, which leads up to David as king writing these psalms. And, and we don't have time to go back and, and read through all of that this morning, but just to really quickly try to recap enough of it that you can track along with what's going here. So if you remember, we actually went through Genesis not that long ago, but if you remember this part of the storyline of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created Adam and Eve as the first humans. He placed them in the Garden of Eden and established his kingdom, which if you were around for our Genesis series, we talked about how that means that God intended for Adam and Eve and their children to live as God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. And Adam and Eve then were supposed to exercise dominion over creation under God's authority. And they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply and extend God's rule and blessing then to the whole earth. But the serpent came along and tempted Adam and Eve to rebel against God's authority and take his throne for themselves. And they listened to the serpent, right? And they ate from the tree they were told not to eat from. As a result, they were cast out of God's presence and they began to suffer the consequences of their rebellion. But God promised in Genesis 3.15 that he would send an offspring of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent and undo the effects of the fall. Well, then in Genesis 12, fast forwarding several years into the future, God chose Abraham to be the family line that he would form this new people of God through. He promised then that he would give them a place of their own and that he would bless all the families of the earth through them. So God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing once again. And those promises lead then to God rescuing the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt further down the road, taking them to the promised land then and establishing a kingdom for them there. And the king then that God chose at that point in history was David. And, and then in 2 Samuel chapter 7 then, God comes to King David and gives him an even greater promise than what he's already fulfilled in David's life up to that point. 2 Samuel chapter 7, let me just read starting in verse 12, says, when your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, talking about David here, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I'll discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. 
your throne shall be established forever. So God promised David an offspring from his line who would be the fulfillment of all the promises going back to Adam. He would be the one to fully and finally restore God's kingdom. And his reign then is never going to end. And so that promised one who would fulfill all those promises to Adam, Abraham, and David is the Messiah, the promised king. He's the one who would be greater than David and have authority over David. So he's David's son and yet David's Lord. Like that's who God is talking to here in Psalm 110 verse 1. God God says to him, to David's Lord, to the Messiah. Even that word says here in this verse is important. It's a word that means announces, like in in a prophetic sense. It's like in the places in the prophets where they say, thus says the Lord. Like this isn't God just talking. This is God making a pronouncement. Like this is God making a weighty and significant promise to David's Lord, to the Messiah. So look at what he says to him here in the rest of verse 1. He says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So God tells the Messiah to sit at his right hand. Not just on the throne in Jerusalem where David sat as king, but at God's right hand in his throne room. Like, like there's no other, there's no higher throne that anyone could be given. And, and the right hand is the place of power and authority, like the place of highest honor. So the right hand of God is the highest place of honor that exists. And the word sit there has the sense of sit and stay seated. Like, so God tells the Messiah to sit in the place of highest honor at his right hand and stay there. Until, he says, until I make your enemies your footstool. And so just think about that picture for a second. Like, can you imagine using someone as your footstool or or someone using you as their footstool to, to have to bend over before them while they put their dirty, smelly feet up on you? Like, maybe you could get away with doing that with someone you're goofing around with, friends or family or something like that. But, but the only way you could do that to your enemies is if you had utterly conquered and defeated them. Like, you use your enemies as your footstool to show them and to show everyone else who's in control. And so, see the contrast here between the Messiah in the place of highest honor and his enemies in the place of lowest humiliation. And the point here isn't that the Messiah will only sit at God's right hand until this happens, and then he'll have to get up. Like, the point is that his enemies are never going to be a threat to him. He will sit there until his enemies are defeated, and then he'll keep sitting there. He's going to be seated there forever. Like, this is how God is going to fulfill his promise to David, that he will establish the throne of David's offspring forever. He's going to do it by seating the Messiah at his own right hand and utterly defeating all of his enemies and putting them in subjection under his feet. Like, that's the first pronouncement that God makes here in this psalm. The Messiah will be the ultimate, eternal king from the line of David. Which, at one level, we hear that, and, and like, that's great. Like, that's awesome. But, but the implications of this are so much bigger than we initially realized. Like, look at the next couple of verses and how they unpack what it means that the Messiah will be the ultimate eternal king from the line of David. That's what we see in verses 2 and 3. We see two results of this first pronouncement here. See the first result in verse 2. And it's this. The Messiah will exercise dominion over his enemies. The Messiah will exercise dominion over his enemies. Look with me at verse 2. It says, The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So here at the beginning of verse 2, we, we have the Lord in small caps again. So, so this is God acting now. He, he speaks in verse 1, and now he takes action in verse 2 as a result of what he said. And, and what God does then as a result is send forth from Zion the mighty scepter of the Messiah. So in verse 1, God tells the Messiah to sit at his right hand, the place of highest honor. 
and, and in case it's not clear what that means, here it's clarified. He's sitting at God's right hand in Zion, which, which in one sense can refer to Jerusalem as the capital city of God's people, Israel, but it's also symbolic of God's throne room, the, the place where he rules and reigns all things from. And the Messiah is holding the mighty scepter, the, the symbol of kingly authority in Zion at God's right hand. So, so the Messiah is ruling as king from God's right hand. And God then is sending forth or stretching out from Zion this symbol of his rule and reign through the Messiah. And so what this pictures is the rule and reign of God through the Messiah extending out and expanding out from Zion. And if that's not clear enough, the final line of the verse says, rule in the midst of your enemies. And that word rule there is the same word as have dominion in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Like this is what God called Adam to do in the beginning, to, to have dominion over all creation as an extension of God's authority and, and to the, extend and expand God's authority from Eden to the ends of the earth. Adam failed to do that. As we talked our, about already, when Adam was faced with an enemy, the, the serpent in the garden, Adam didn't rule over his enemy. His enemy deceived him and Adam fell. But where Adam failed, the Messiah will not. He will rule or have dominion in the midst of his enemies. Like his enemies will not deceive him or cause him to fall. They'll, they'll try to oppose him, but God will extend and expand his rule and reign through, through the Messiah in spite of and ultimately over his enemies. Like, do you see how big a deal this is then? Like, this isn't just about the Messiah becoming king in Israel. This is about a human having dominion over the earth like God intended from the beginning. And even the enemies who try to overthrow and to desire to overthrow his dominion won't be able to stop it this time. Oh, but that's not all. Like, the second result of this pronouncement then that we see in verse 3 is this. It's that the Messiah's people will gladly submit to his glorious reign. That's what we're going to see here in verse 3. And verse 3 is tricky. Um, if you have an ESV, you'll notice that there are footnotes on, on basically every line. Um, and I love the, the one on the last line here, um, which says, the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. So basically they're saying, we have no idea what this means. Um, but, but the main reason it's tricky is that this is all poetic language. That's, that's meant to create pictures in our minds more than it's meant to necessarily make sense, if that makes sense. Like, if we, if we let it be poetic language, we can start to see the picture that David's painting for us here. And so let's read through this, and we'll talk about what is going on here in this verse. So, so verse 3 says, Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. So what in the world does all that mean? Well, in one sense, the main thing this verse is doing is contrasting your enemies at the end of verse 2, who will be ruled over by the mighty scepter of the king, with your people in verse 3, at the beginning of verse 3, who will offer themselves freely here in verse 3. Like that's the main contrast going on here. And so the, when we're talking about his people and what they're going to do, the phrase offer, them free, offer themselves freely here um, is actually the word for free will offerings that, that the people of Israel would have been familiar with. The, the, the sacrificial system had all kinds of rules about which types of sacrifices to offer in which situations to cover different types of sin and, and to cover different types of circumstances. But on top of that, if someone just wanted to express praise and worship or, or give thanks to the Lord, they could give a free will offering. It wasn't required. It was totally voluntary. It was just the overflow of a heart of worship. And so that's the word that's used here. And actually, the way this is worded, there's not even a verb in that first line. It's just your people, free will offerings, meaning that, that they themselves are the free will offerings. And so the, the point is, in, in contrast with the Messiah's enemies in verse 2, who do not submit to his dominion, but he rules over them anyway, 
the Messiah's people will, will gladly submit to him. They'll offer themselves to him as free will offerings. And, and this happens on the day of your power. And, and that's talking there about the day when God enthrones the Messiah as king, as we've seen in the first two verses. And, and so then this is where it gets tricky to follow from there on. And so when it talks about in holy garments and all this stuff about the, the womb of the morning and the dew of your youth, like not only does it just sound weird, it, it's not even super clear who it's talking about. So like, is this the Messiah or is this his people? And so I think there's a couple of things going on here in the rest of this verse. I think the most obvious way to take these phrases here is as describing the Messiah on the day of his power. Like on that day, he will be dressed in holy garments or, or in holy splendor. From the womb of the morning there paints this picture of the, the first breaking of light into the darkness. Like on the day of his power, the Messiah dressed in holy splendor is going to be like the breaking of dawn after a long, dark night. And the dew then in the rest of the verse comes with the morning, right? That's when, that's when the dew appears in the morning. And it symbolizes refreshment and restoration and life, which ties into this idea of his, his youth belonging to him, as if life and, and youthful vitality will, will characterize this king. And so putting all this together, then you have this picture of, of the king arrayed in holiness and light and life and, and his people being so in awe of their king and his glory that they gladly then submit themselves to him and give themselves to him. But the thing is, part of the reason I think the language is a little vague here is because the king not only rules and reigns over his people, he represents his people. Like, as goes the king, so goes the people. So in gladly submitting to him as their king, the Messiah's people also share in his holiness, his light, his life. Like they share in his rule and blessing. It's God's kingdom restored. God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Like it's what we've been waiting for since Genesis chapter 3. Like, that's what Psalm 110 says it means that the Messiah is the ultimate eternal king from the line of David. It means he will exercise dominion over his enemies, and it means that his people will gladly submit to his glorious reign and all the ways that, that that fulfills what God promised to Adam and Abraham and David. Oh, and that's only the first pronouncement here in Psalm 110. In verse 4, God speaks again about the Messiah. And, and the second pronouncement is, is this. Not only will Messiah be the ultimate eternal king from the line of David, the Messiah will be the ultimate eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, and this is so good. Look, look with me at verse 4. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so once again, starts off again with the Lord here in small caps. So this is God speaking again. And once again, he's not just talking. He's swearing an oath. He's making a promise. And he's not going to go back on this or change his mind. The, the you here is the same person he's been talking to and about since verse 1. So, so the Messiah again. And what God announces here is that the Messiah is not only the ultimate eternal king from the line of David, he's also the ultimate eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so what does that mean? Well, there's a couple of things we need to understand here to, to, for this to hit us the way that it's supposed to. Number one, while, while the king is intended to represent God's rule and authority, a priest primarily intercedes between God and, and God's people, or even between God's people and God. And so as a result of the fall, we no longer have access to God's presence. Like our sin makes us unclean and separates us from God. And, and the job of the priest that's, that's laid out in the Bible is to discern between the clean and the unclean and, and through offering sacrifices then rid the people of uncleanness so that God's presence can dwell with his people again. So we tend to think of this as a role that's unique to Israel, but actually goes all the way back to Adam. 
Like not only was Adam to have dominion over creation like a king, he was to work and keep the garden. The only other places where those, the only other place where those two words work and keep are used uh, is to describe the role of the priest. And the tabernacle even that the priest would minister in was designed to be this, this mini garden decorated with trees and fruit and, and even angels guarding the presence of God. And so, so the priest was supposed to do in the tabernacle what Adam was supposed to do in the Garden of Eden, to discern between clean and unclean and rid not only the people in, in Adam's case, but, but the land of uncleanness so that the presence of God could dwell with them. But again, Adam failed in his priestly responsibility. He didn't rid the land of uncleanness. He allowed the unclean serpent to enter and deceive him. And as a result, he became unclean himself and could no longer dwell in God's presence. And so the Messiah then is called to be the priest that Adam was supposed to be. But surprisingly, not a priest after the order of Levi, like the priests of Israel. Instead, he's called to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so why is that? Well, for one reason, because David was from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi, where the priests were from. And so David's son couldn't be that order of priest. But not only that, the book of Hebrews shows how as necessary as the Levitical priesthood was for the time that God instituted it, it was insufficient and it was temporary. Like the Levitical priests couldn't fully and finally rid the people or the land of the uncleanness that needed to be, that needed to be cleaned up for, for two reasons. One, they were sinners themselves. So they had to offer sacrifices for themselves as well as the people. And number two, they were human. So they died and they couldn't continue in the office of priest forever like they would need to, to be able to fully and finally complete the work of a priest. And so what we need is a different order of priest. We need a superior order of priest. And that's what Hebrews says is the point of the Messiah being of the order of Melchizedek. And so who is this guy? Um, who is Melchizedek? Well, if, again, going back to Genesis, if you remember our Genesis series again, in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham is living in the land of Canaan now. And, and at, at this point in history, this coalition of kings, it seems like it kind of comes out of nowhere, but this coalition of kings start a campaign to take over the surrounding cities in the land of Canaan. And one of the places they take over is Sodom, where Adam's nephew Lot was living. And they take Lot captive and carry him off. And so at this point in the story, like this, this group of kings is a threat to Abraham and God's promises to Abraham. So what's going to happen? Well, Abraham goes after these kings and he defeats them and he brings back everything that they took. And when Abraham came back, two men come out to meet him. One is the king of Sodom. And the other is Melchizedek, who we're told in Genesis 14 is the king of Salem and priest of God Most High. <clears throat> and Abraham is then confronted with a choice. The king of Sodom offers to let Abraham keep all the wealth he had taken in the battle. And so will Abraham choose to receive the blessing at the hand of the king of Sodom? Or will he trust God to keep his promise to bless him? If you remember, Abraham refuses the king of Sodom's offer and instead gives a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek, priest of God most high, as an act of faith that God would keep his promises to bless him. And Melchizedek then pronounces a blessing from God most high on Abraham. And so the book of Hebrews then connects the dots for us here in, in, in Hebrews chapter 7 to show how Melchizedek in this account in Genesis 14, is a superior priest that the Messiah needed to follow after. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, points out that Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. And he's also king of Salem, which means king of peace. And so we need a priest who is also a king, and we need a priest who is righteous and who brings peace. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3 points out that in the account in Genesis 14, Melchizedek just comes out of nowhere and then disappears again. It's like he had no beginning and he has no end. 
And so it's not that Melchizedek actually was immortal. It, it's just that literarily in the story, it's like he lives forever. And so he remains a priest forever. And that's exactly what the emphasis is in Psalm 110 verse 4. You are a priest forever. Like we need a priest who lives forever and remains priest forever like Melchizedek. On top of that, Hebrews 7 verses 4 through 10 point out that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, which implies that Melchizedek was superior to Abraham and ultimately then to Abraham's descendant, Levi. Like, like this is what we need. A, a priest from an order greater than Levi, who is both king and priest, who is righteous and doesn't need to offer sacrifices for himself, who brings peace and who lives forever so he can remain priest forever. Like that's what Melchizedek represents. And, and that's the order of priests then that God promises the Messiah will be in his second pronouncement here in Psalm 110, which again is already really, really good. But, but look at then the two results that, that flow out of this pronouncement and then unpack what it means that, that he's the ultimate eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. We see the first result in verses five and six. And it's, that the, it's this, it's, it's that the Messiah will defeat the serpent and his offspring once and for all. The Messiah will defeat the serpent and his offspring once and for all. So look with me at verse 5. It says, the Lord is at your right hand. And so notice here that so far, all four sections of this psalm, the two pronouncements in verse 1 and verse 4, the two sections of results starting in verse 2 and verse 5, each start with the Lord. But, but here, the Lord isn't in small caps. It's just lowercase. So here, it's not talking about God. It's talking about the Messiah. So, so the focus here shifts from God to the Messiah. And, and the point here is that the Messiah is now at God's right hand, which connects back to verse 1, the position he's given as king, but it also ties into his, his priestly work coming off of this pronouncement here. And so the, as priest, he has access to God's presence. And so he is at God's right hand as king and as priest. And so look then at the result of the Messiah being at God's right hand as king and priest. We get these three he will statements in the rest of verse 5 and verse 6 here. And again, the he here in light of verse 5 is the Messiah. So this is what the Messiah is going to do as a result of being at God's right hand as king and priest. It says, he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Oh, this is, this is so huge. So think first about the connection to Genesis 14 here because of the connection to Melchizedek that we just saw. That should be in, ringing in our ears as we read these verses. And so what did Abraham do just before he met Melchizedek? He defeated this coalition of kings, right, who threatened the fulfillment of God's promises, well, here the Messiah does the same thing. He's going to defeat these kings who threaten the fulfillment of God's promises. Oh, but it's not only that. Verse 6 then, we get this progression from kings to nations to chiefs, which on one level could all be parallel and interchangeable. But the, the key that, that says it's, it's more than that is that the word translated chiefs there in verse 6 is actually just the Hebrew word head, singular, so it, it'd be better translated, he will shatter the head over the wide earth. And so the progression is actually from kings, the individual kings, to nations that the kings rule and reign over, to the head over the wide earth who's over all of this. And, and so then when we talk about shattering the head of the wide earth, like what does that bring to mind? Genesis 3.15, right? The promise from after the fall that God would send an offspring of the woman who would crush or shatter the head of the serpent, the ultimate embodiment of evil over the whole wide earth. So the point of verse 5 and 6 here is that these kings and nations that are shattered and judged are shattered and judged because they have aligned themselves with the serpent as a threat to the fulfillment of the promises of God. And, and because of that, they have become offspring of the serpent. But the Messiah is going to do the priestly work that Adam failed to do. 
He's going to discern between clean and unclean, and he's going to rid the land of uncleanness by crushing the head of the serpent and his offspring once and for all. Like, that's what we've been waiting for since Genesis chapter 3. Like, that's what we need so God's presence can dwell with his people again and his kingdom can be restored. Oh, but that's not the only result of the Messiah being the ultimate eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. The other result we see in verse 7 is this. It's, it's that the Messiah will be exalted. And so we see this in verse 7. We, we get two more he will statements about the Messiah here in this verse. It says in verse 7, He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. And so the word brook here is, is what is known in, in the Middle East as a wadi, which it, it's a dry stream bed for most of the year, but then it'll, it'll flood and be full of water when there's a heavy rain. And the word way there is, is the word for road. And so the, the picture here is of the Messiah returning from completing his priestly work of ridding the land of uncleanness, and, and he's drinking and being refreshed by a wadi filled with water along the side of the road. And it says, therefore, he will lift up his head. So, so the contrast here is, is between the head being shattered by the Messiah in verse 6 and here now the head of the Messiah being lifted up or exalted. And the reason is because he drinks from this wadi by the road, which, which could just be that, that it's because drinking, by, drinking from the wadi by the road like that was, was symbolic of, of a victorious return from battle. It could just be that. But there, there may be more going on here as well. And so the first thing that this brings to mind is that if that wadi is filled with water at this time and not just dry right now in this moment when, when, the, when the Messiah needs it, it's because God is providentially providing for the Messiah and he's depending on the Lord to provide for him and bless him and ultimately exalt him. Which in the context of Psalms then ought to call to mind the picture of the tree in Psalm 1 in the introduction to the, to the whole book of Psalms that should be in our minds as we read through all these Psalms, right? The, the tree planted by streams of water bearing fruit as a symbol of the righteous man who delights in the law of the Lord and who's blessed then by the Lord. But on top of all that, this picture of, of a dry wadi becoming filled with water also gets picked up in later Bible passages and becomes a symbol for the kingdom of God. And so just listen to one passage where, where the, the author of, of Isaiah, Isaiah 35, um, Isaiah says this about the coming kingdom of God. This is how he describes the coming kingdom of God. He says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams, there's our word, it's actually the word wadi again, in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there. It shall be called the way or the road of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they're fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Like that's the picture we see here in Psalm 110 verse 7. And that's the picture that we see in Revelation 22 as well. With the river of life flowing from the throne of God down the middle of the road and the tree of life on either side of the river. 
And so you can make the argument then from this verse, I think that the, that the point here is that the kingdom of God is established through the priestly work of the Messiah. And it's because of this then that he's exalted to the right hand of God, bringing this entire psalm full circle, which is exactly the point Hebrews makes in chapter 10, verses 11 to 14. Here's what Hebrews says. It says, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made the footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so do you see the point that Hebrews is making here? It's, it's, the point is that the single sacrifice the Messiah offers to defeat his enemies and purify his people is himself. And it's through his death and resurrection that he's exalted then to the right hand of God to sit at his right hand until his enemies are made his footstool. And so his priestly work is inseparable from his kingly work. It's, it's through his work as priest that he takes his throne as king and he rules and reigns forever as both king and priest. Like that's the point of Psalm 110. Even though God makes these two separate pronouncements about the Messiah being king and priest, the pictures are mixed all the way through. The king is dressed in holy garments like a priest, and the priest is exalted to the right hand of God like a king. And so the whole point is that the Messiah will be both king and priest, and that we need him to be both, to fulfill the promises God made to David and to Abraham and to Adam, and to restore the kingdom of God so that we can once again be God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing. So when the angels announced to the shepherds that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, Psalm 110 is being fulfilled in that moment. Like Jesus was born to be the ultimate eternal king from the line of David and the ultimate eternal priest from after the order of Melchizedek. Like Jesus is the king priest we've been waiting and longing for. Jesus lived the perfect righteous life that we failed to live. He offered himself then on the cross as the perfect sacrifice that takes away our sins. He rose from the dead on the third day and he was exalted to the right hand of God where he is seated right now, ruling and reigning over all things as king and interceding for us as priests until the day when he will return and complete the work he began. On that day, he will defeat his enemies and rid the land of uncleanness once and for all. And we will dwell with him as God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing forever and ever and ever. Like that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. So, so what does all that mean for us here together this morning? Like how should we respond to what we've seen here in Psalm 110? Let me give you four quick responses here in closing. Um, and these are going to have to be quick, but, but hopefully this will make sense in a lot of everything we've seen. First, gladly submit to the glorious king. Gladly submit to the glorious king. These aren't on your handout, but you can write them down if you want. In a lot of ways, this is the point of verses 1 through 3. Everyone will bow the knee to King Jesus one way or another. The question is whether you'll be made a footstool for his feet as one of his enemies who resists his rule, or whether you will gladly submit to him as one of his people and share in his holiness, light, and life in his glorious reign. Oh, if you have not bowed the knee to Jesus as your king, you can do that today. Let this be the Christmas. Like, let this be the day when you gladly submit to him as your glorious king so that you can share in his reign and blessing and glory. Second, then, confidently draw near to the faithful priest. Confidently draw near through the faithful priest. Like, this is the response Hebrews calls us to in light of the reality that Jesus is our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, 
And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Oh, Jesus' priestly work means we can come confidently to God now because Jesus has washed us clean and given us access through his blood. Here and now, we do that spiritually through walking by faith, through prayer, through the word, through gathering together as his people. And so draw near to him through those means. Jesus made the way open and and paid for your sins, washed you clean through his blood. That's sweet. But one day we also will be able to draw near to him physically and see his face and dwell with him forever because of Jesus' work as priest. And so draw near to him through his work as priest. Third then, joyfully celebrate the birth of our king priest. Joyfully celebrate the birth of our king priest. Oh, Psalm 110 is why it makes sense for a multitude of angels to sing praises to God at the birth of Jesus. And Psalm 110 is why his birth is good news of great joy for all people. And so I pray these truths from Psalm 110 will cause all of us to feel the great joy that the birth of Jesus ought to stir in our hearts. So he was born to be our king priest and he rules and intercedes for us as king priest right now. That should cause us to joyfully celebrate this Christmas. Oh, but Christmas isn't the end of the story. Jesus began his work through his birth, life, death, resurrection. But as we celebrate the first coming of our king priest at Christmas, we also look forward to his second coming, which which leads to the final response. And it's this, to eagerly anticipate the coming return and eternal reign of our king priest. Eagerly anticipate the coming return and eternal reign of our king priests. Like Advent isn't just about manufacturing emotions so that we feel more joy at Christmas. It's about remembering that we're still waiting for the ultimate fulfillment of what Jesus began at Christmas. At his first coming, he inaugurated the kingdom. When he returns, he will consummate his kingdom. He will rid the land of uncleanness once and for all, and he will dwell with us, arrayed in holiness and light and life. And those who gladly submit to him as king and who draw near to him as priest will share in the glory and blessing of his kingdom. God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing forever and ever and ever. And so, oh, we eagerly anticipate that day. And we joyfully celebrate how Jesus' birth begins it and guarantees it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Psalm 110 and for everything that it points us to in Jesus. Everything that it shows us that he is, everything that it helps us see that he fulfills. Um, Lord, it's so easy to get distracted by everything going on around us this time of year, to get caught up in the nostalgia and the, the lights and the, the fun things that are all part of Christmas. And they're, they're good. They're, they are, they're great. But help us, Father, to remember what we're ultimately celebrating, to remember what Christmas is all about, that it's about the birth of the king. It's about the birth of the king priest. It's about the birth of Jesus, who is Christ the Lord, our Savior, and how he became all those things for us through his priestly work of living the perfect life that we failed to live, offering his blood and his body to be broken as the sacrifice that takes away our sin, and then his resurrection and exaltation to your right hand where he rules and reigns and intercedes for us now while we wait for the day that he'll return and complete his work and establish his kingdom and we'll be with him forever because of his work as king and priest. Lord, give us hearts that just overflow with rejoicing and joy as we meditate on and think about and realize even more what it means that that baby, that king was born on Christmas Day. Lord, help us to respond in all these ways that we talked about to this passage. Lord, give us hearts that gladly submit to Jesus as our King. Lord, give us hearts that that confidently draw near to you through Jesus as our priest. Give us hearts that 
that joyfully celebrate the, the birth of our King at Christmas and give us hearts that eagerly anticipate his coming return and his eternal reign as King over all things. Lord, stir all of those things up in us through this passage this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.